So one of the kinds of changes in the rock that can happen because of stress, it's called strain, is folds. Folds happen whenever the rock will not crack or buckle under the pressure that it's put under, but instead it will actually deform. So folds would actually be more likely to take place in locks which are more elastic or ductile-like or rocks which are more plastic. And these are rocks are typically weaker rocks in the sense that they actually allow themselves to be bent. And this would also typically be common among where the stress is not too intense or does not last um, too long, right, or it comes too fast. And so it also whenever there's a lot of uh, higher temperatures and a wetter rock. So deeper into the ground and when, it, when the stress is applied slowly over a long period of time without lasting exactly too long is when you would actually get these kinds of things happening. So for example, when you get an elastic and you stretch it, you can actually stretch that considerably because it's elastic, right? Because of the, sort of the property of it. So it's very ductile. You can actually change its shape quite a lot. But if this it happens too fast or too strong or lasts too long, what happens to the elastic? It will eventually crack. And so that's what happens to rocks as well. But as long as the exposure and the intensity is not too much for the rock and the rock has a property of actually withstanding that and the temperature is typically higher and a little wetter the rock will actually tend to bend and form these folds. Well, now when it comes with the actual anatomy of the fold it actually has three basic parts. The axial plane is the area that cuts the fold in half along that half you usually found the hinge. The hinge is the location from which the fold starts and extending from that hinge you're gonna have the limbs of the rock which in this case are folding downwards and you can see that whenever the folds are downwards like that, we call that anticline because the oldest rock or the ancient rock, anti for ancient, is going to be at the center of the, of the fold. While the syncline happens when you have the fold happening upwards from the hinge, exposing the youngest rock in the center. All right. Now notice that both folds in the picture were flattened on the top because it doesn't really look like this usually. A after a while, what, ha what happens to the rock is it has eroded off the top and you won't even actually see the pattern of the fold unless you take a cross section of the rock and or if the rock is uplifted exposing this fold as you will see in the pictures which are about to come up. All right. Now sometimes after the fold actually happens, a piece of the fold actually sinks underneath the ground. And we call that a strike and dip situation. Strike is the actual area from where the dip will start. And then the dip line will actually be the, air, the actual um, difference between the, where they're supposed to be and how much it plunged. So this angle here will form this dip line. All right. Now what that will do is it will shift the fold entirely uh, down. So you would have the strike area and then the dip line either because one side was uplifted or because the other side subsided and which will create a strange fold. So let's actually look at some of these folds and examples of it so you can see what we're talking about. So you have the syncline and anticycline on an undeformed rock becoming deformed because of compression and you see that what's actually happening is that you're having the formation of an anticline because the oldest is in the center or a syncline because the youngest is in the center. And But these folds are not tilted. It means the horizontal uh, reference plane is actually touching the top of the fold. However, if you were to tilt, as you can see happening here in the right side, then you're going to have a plunging fold on top of this happening. And this will all happen you, typically because of the types of stress that the rock will be under. So if you actually see how they will look like in a topographical map, you will see that the anticline will look, you see the anticline and syncline, what does it normally do? But in the case of the plunging fold, it will actually look and will change the pattern of the way it looks like because one side will be higher than the other. And you see how that's happening here in this rock that has the anticline and the syncline. And you have the same thing happen here, but it's plunging downwards. And you see that happening in that rock. So folds are going to be happening because of all kinds of stress. Now, typically folds will happen because of compression stress because that's what's usually going to cause the rock to actually form those synclines and anticlines, but it could also happen because of shear stress, where the rocks are, are, are folded sideways in extra to each other, all right? And we will see that as we view the types of strain later on, all right? Now here you're actually seeing what's actually causing the, that plunge. You actually see the, the, the strike line over there, and that's the area where the, the, where the dip will start from, and then you have the dip line, where you actually see the rock actually um, dipping from that that fold and that's what we call those strike and dip situations where and if this rock happened to be folded then you would see the pattern that we saw on the previous screen remember you have the strike line where the, or the area which from which the fold will start 
And then you have the dip line, which is the area that's actually misaligned with the reference point that you're supposed to, to have. This is very common in your shorelines, as you can see in these pictures. But it will happen everywhere as well. Okay? Now, if it comes to come about the size of folds, folds can be as small as a small rock that's folded, as you can see here. All right, or it can be really large rocks which are folded, including entire mountains, which you think about are uh, basically anticlines, or entire mountain ranges, which are full of synclines and anticlines together. And so you see that these folds can happen at the macro level or micro level inside of rocks. And that's a very, very important thing or part of our deformation of the crust lecture. Now, some examples of real folds include the ones we talked about, which are anticline and synclines, which we've very commonly seen mountain ranges like the ones you see here, or monoclines. Monoclines will happen when the the fold only only one piece kind of dips downwards, usually because either of the, because of the subsidence of this piece or because of the uplift of the other piece. Either way, it will cause the shifting downwards, and you see a syncline happen here. It's kind of like similar to what happens with the strike and dip situation. All right, so you end up getting a syncline um, when you look at it laterally. You, you end up getting a monocline. All right. Another kind of fold is called the under overturn fold, and that's when some that syncline or inter, uh, an anticline region actually gets shifted towards the side like this, and you end up with a fold that looks like that, as you can see in this picture. And those we call those overturn folds. So these are variations of what we talked about with synclines and anticlines. All right. Now, some more examples of advanced folds include, for example, domes and basins, and you see them here. The basin is when a two-dimensional fold almost, as in all the pieces are kind of folded towards the center here, inwards into the ground. And a dome is the opposite when all the pieces kind of fold higher into one center point. So kind of like, think of it as a three-dimensional um, syncline would basically be called a uh, basin, and a three-dimensional anticline would basically be called a dome, all right? You also have things like chevrons, and chevrons are usually happen when you have something that looks like an overturn fold with very sharp, sharp lines like you see here. All right, this is very interesting as well. You also have this other one here called recumbent fold, and that's when uh, an entire folded region got shifted, almost kind of throw sideways, right? So instead of looking like the normal anti-syncline or syncline, the rock was kind of like dipped sideways as well, and you get this recumbent fold. And you also have all other kinds of, you have slumps, for example, and slumps happen when the, when the a fold basically gets shifted to the side, and... So imagine if you have a syncline like this, and then this just kind of slides sideways, so you form like something like that, and that's what called, like a slump is called. And you also have things like pigmatic and parasit parasitic folds, which have something to do with the difference between rock and the rock running them. These strange fold-like patterns. That one was the pigmatic, that one parasitic folds. You really need to know this kind of detail, and especially when it comes to chevrons, recumbent, and slumps, and pigmatic, and parasitic folds. But I just want to point out to you that you can take a long, long course about these kinds of folds because the, the crust is moving in a lot of different ways. It's moving upwards, it's moving downwards, it's moving sideways all at the same time, which causes changes to the syncline and anti-syncline basic pattern that we talked about. All right? Think of it this way. If you apply uh, shear stress... To the rock at the same time we're applying um, compression stress you're going to cause different kinds of fold and that's kind of the idea that we're going for here now the take home point with folds is that they come in a lot of different sizes and it, it, it can be as small as a rock or as large as a ginormous rock formation that we count mountain ranges for example and that they come usually in the simple syncline anticline pattern caused by compression but the shear stress can also change laterally the way they look like and remembering because of sub the sub subsidence and uplift, these folds can be actually shifted downwards or upwards, causing it to become a plunging fold. We also talked about the fact that since this process will continue, and sometimes even after the fold, it will, it will be folded even more to the side, you get overturned folds and things like that. Uplift and subsidence can also cause things like monoclines. You also have domes and bases and chevrons, recumbent folds, slump folds, pegmatic folds, parasitic folds, all of these kinds of folds because the ground is moving in a lot of different directions all at once. When you have a plate tectonics movement, you don't actually have just one type of movement, but these movements are actually in different directions. And then when you add to that isostatic adjustments, the ground is being deformed in a lot of different directions, which is why you have a lot of different kinds of folds. But the take-home point is that if the rock is not pushed beyond the point that it can take and it happens to be a ductile rock, it can actually fold.
all right? So on the next video, we will talk about faults. I'll see you then.